Welcome to the deep dive. We're here to you know really get into the topics that matter and give you the full picture. Today, we're plunging into a really powerful natural event, one that sent ripples uh, quite literally across the globe. We're talking about a series of intense earthquakes off Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula. So our mission today is to unpack the specifics. These quakes, the tsunami alerts both near and far, and what it all tells us about, well, our planet and these complex warning systems. Okay, let's unpack this. Yeah, and what's truly fascinating here, I think, is how an event that feels maybe quite distant for many listeners, it becomes this critical real-world test, you know, for our global warning infrastructure. It's not just about the geology of the plates colliding, but also about those real-time, uh, high-stakes decisions that have to be made when the Earth really shakes things up. Absolutely. So the main event, and we're looking at this series of earthquakes, they hit on July 20th, 2025. Though interestingly, for places like Hawaii, the alerts actually started going out late on July 19th, their time, Hawaii Standard Time. And we're talking about a significant seismic punch here, the biggest tremor. That clocked in at magnitude 7.4, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, a 7.4, that's energy equivalent to, well, thousands of atomic bombs. Powerful enough to cause major devastation if it hit right under a city. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't just one jolt either. It's better described as a um, a swarm of quakes. They happened yeah. really quickly, one after another, all within about an hour, basically. Concentrated off the coast of Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky in Russia. So you had the big 7.4, yes, but there were others right there with it. A 7.0, a couple of 6.7s, I think, and a 6.6. And what really boosts their potential impact is how shallow they were. The 7.4 was only about 20 kilometers deep, and another one, a 6.6, .6, was even shallower shallower just 10 kilometers. Think of it like this. The closer an earthquake rupture is to the surface, well, less energy gets absorbed by the rock on the way up, so you get more intense shaking at the surface and, crucially, a much greater chance of displacing water and causing it a significant tsunami. All right, and just to place this geographically for everyone, the epicenter, or epicenters really, were about 140 to 144 kilometers east of Petropavlovsk Kamchansky. And that's not a small town, it's a city population somewhere between what 160,000 and 180,000 people so a major center potentially in the impact zone okay so the ground shaking these powerful shallow quakes the immediate question then becomes the coast right yeah the tsunami threat exactly yep. and the u.s tsunami warning system they didn't waste any time. They issued a threat for the Kamchatka coast almost immediately. They certainly did. The initial U.S. forecast for Russia, it suggested waves maybe reaching uh, 0.3 meters up to about one meter above the normal tide level. But what's quite interesting is how the Russian Ministry of Emergency Situations handled it. They got much more granular. They gave specific predictions for different districts, like no more than 60 centimeters for the Aleutian district, uh, 40 centimeters for East Kamchatka, and only about 15 centimeters for the Petropavlovsk Kamchatka area itself. Mm, much more localized. Very localized. And they even issued this warning telling residents, quote, under no circumstances go to the shore to watch, even while saying the wave height itself would not be high. Mm. It's a tricky balance, isn't it? Warning people, but also trying to prevent you know, unnecessary panic. Yeah. And connecting this to the bigger picture, it just shows how risk assessment is getting more specific. Yeah. Moving beyond just those broad sweeping warnings sometimes. And thankfully, uh, there were no immediate reports of casualties or significant damage and no evacuations were ordered at that point. OK, but it's important to note, even with those lower specific predictions, the official tsunami warnings for Russia did remain active just as a precaution. Mm. Right. But the story doesn't end there. The potential for waves to travel across the entire Pacific, that's where the global system really gets tested. Small tsunami waves were considered possible for Hawaii, Japan, even Midway Atoll. Let's focus on Hawaii for a second. Officials there issued a tsunami watch late Saturday evening, July 19th. That was 9.03 p.m. local time, and the alert from the Honolulu Department of Emergency Management was clear. Tsunami watch issued prepare to act. A tsunami watch means a tsunami is possible, but the situation is still being evaluated pretty direct stuff. Yeah, and this is where you see the incredible speed of the modern systems. That watch in Hawaii, it was canceled just minutes later by 9.42 p.m. So what, less than 40 minutes? Wow, that's fast. Very fast. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center looked at all the incoming data from buoys, seismic readings, and determined, quote, based on all available data, there is no tsunami threat to the state of Hawaii. And it wasn't just Hawaii. Uh, Guam and American Samoa also had initial alerts that were lifted pretty quickly, too. It just shows the technological leap, really, how fast that data comes in, gets processed, analyzed, and then pushed out globally to update or even cancel threats. It prevents unnecessary disruption, unnecessary panic. Okay, so let's step back a bit. 
What does this all tell us? I mean, why Kamchatka? Why is this region such a hot zone for earthquakes? Well, it comes down to location, 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 as they say. The Kamchatka Peninsula sits right on the Pacific Ring of Fire, which many people listening probably know is this huge, like, horseshoe-shaped zone around the Pacific Ocean. It's where most of the world's earthquakes and volcanic eruptions happen. Right. It's basically where several massive tectonic plates meet. And specifically for Kamchatka, it's the boundary where the huge Pacific plate is grinding against and diving under the North American plate. This creates just immense friction and stress deep underground. And that stress builds up, builds up, and then gets released suddenly as earthquakes. It's a constant process, really dynamic. And the history there reflects that, doesn't it? Yeah. I read that since 1900, there have been seven major quakes, magnitude 8.3 or higher, yeah. just in that specific area. That's enormous seismic energy. It really is. So that brings up the question about the warning systems themselves. How do they work? How can they issue an alert like for Hawaii and then cancel it so incredibly fast? It's a really sophisticated process, kind of a dance between the seismic data and the modeling. Right. So warning center scientists, they get preliminary seismic info almost instantly when a big quake happens. Magnitude, location, crucially depth. They use that initial data to make a quick assessment. Could this specific earthquake have generated a tsunami based on its characteristics? Okay. And from that, they issue an alert message. It has different levels, you know, a warning, an advisory, a watch, or maybe just an information statement saying we're looking into it. But the key is these aren't final. They're constantly updated as more data flows in data from deep ocean buoys that actually measure wave heights, more refined seismic analysis. So they can upgrade an alert if the threat looks bigger, or like we saw with Hawaii, they can downgrade or cancel it completely as the situation becomes clearer. It's very dynamic. Right. And those levels are important. Let's just quickly define them so it's crystal clear for everyone listening. Good idea. So a tsunami watch. That means a tsunami is possible. Conditions are right. You need to be ready, prepared to take action if it gets upgraded. Got it. Watch means possible. Exactly. Then there's a tsunami advisory. This means a potential tsunami could cause like strong currents or dangerous waves near the shore. Widespread flooding isn't really expected, but you should definitely stay away from beaches, harbors, marinas. Okay. Advisory is about strong currents. Stay away from the water's edge. Yeah. And then the most serious is a tsunami warning. That means significant widespread flooding is imminent or expected, dangerous coastal flooding, powerful currents. That's when urgent action is needed. Evacuations, protecting life and property. That's the big one. Warning means imminent danger. Take action now. Okay, that's mm -hmm. clear. And just to hammer home the potential reach of these Kamchatka quakes, let's maybe look back at that historical example you mentioned earlier. Right, the 1952 quake. That was November 4th, 1952. A truly massive earthquake, magnitude 9.0, struck off Kamchatka. Now, interestingly, while it caused a lot of damage locally in Kamchatka, reports say there were actually no deaths there, which is quite amazing for a 9.0. Mm -hmm. However, that earthquake generated absolutely enormous tsunami waves. We're talking 9.1 meters, that's 30 feet high. And those waves traveled all the way across the Pacific. They slammed into Hawaii thousands of miles away, causing huge damage there. It's just a stark reminder, isn't it? A quake way over there in that specific active zone can have devastating consequences on the other side of the ocean. What a powerful example. 30-foot waves in Hawaii from a contracted quake. Yeah. So, okay, let's try and wrap this up. What we've seen here is this rapid fire sequence of powerful quakes off Russia, a real time event unfolding. And we saw this kind of dual response, an immediate threat in Russia managed with some really specific localized warnings. And then this cautious watch across the wider Pacific, especially for Hawaii, which was then, you know, very quickly resolved thanks to the warning systems. It really highlights just how sophisticated these global systems are now, not just detecting the event, but analyzing it predicting the impact and getting that information out fast. It's uh, quite impressive when you think about it. It really is. And perhaps a final thought for you, the listener, how does understanding this, the speed, the complexity, these global events unfolding in minutes and the systems we've built to try and manage them, how does that change how you think about information, about mm -hmm. being prepared, about how interconnected our world really is? What else might you want to dig into, you know, about the Earth's power and how we live with it? Definitely some food for thought there. We hope this deep dive gave you some valuable insights. Keep exploring, keep asking questions. Until next time.